First of all, uh, let me thank uh, Kamran Jam uh, Charitable Trust, uh, Dr. Hassan Hakimian, and Soas for this honor uh, to be able to stand in front of you and present two lectures about a topic uh, which I had a great uh, difficulty to try to actually define it in the uh, matter of two hours, given the fact that, as it was pointed out, it's the gist of a book that I've been writing for the past two decades at least. <laughs> and uh, I should therefore start with some disclaimers. Uh, the first of them being that I'm in the presence of a group of uh, those faces that are familiar to me. Um, excellent scholars, publishers, journalists, and enthusiasts who know about Iran probably more than I do. Uh, and uh, uh, second is that uh, I have pointed out, as uh, Dr. Hakimian just mentioned, a range of topics that would have been easier to cover within two lectures. but. Uh, he chose the most difficult. <laughs> and uh, therefore, I'm not, I'm, I'm very kind of, uh, how should I put it, on easy grounds. So I don't know how far I would be able to succeed to try to give you something that wouldn't bore you or disappoint you. Given the fact that uh, when I started writing this book, the contract with the publisher and we have a publisher here. I have to be very careful about publishers. <laughs> so uh, uh, we agreed on 350 pages. By the time it's finished, it's three times that size. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's one thing. And then uh, the publisher also asked me to change the title. After much debate, I agreed the new title, just in case when the book is out. And if you are still interested, uh, it's called uh, Iran, a modern history. Very generic, I would say. You know. OK. Well, it covers some uh, five centuries of history of Iran. And therefore, the first question that comes to mind is, why modern? I mean, after all, when I have encountered many of colleagues and friends and people who inquired about uh, the title of the book, say, 1501, Safavid Empire, you're talking about modern. And I think part of my task is here to answer this question in the course of these two lectures. Of course, for historians these days, something which is called this long-term history, long durée, since at least um, the time of the analysis school, is well known. Uh, the fact that you look at this uh, course of uh, material culture or economic uh, uh, evolving uh, uh, development uh, over a long period of time uh, is something very familiar. Um, and mine, to some extent, is, uh, I would say, loyal to that concept. However, somewhere that I probably part from that uh, uh, accepted notion of the long durée is that um, I have, surprisingly, when I finished the book, I noticed that I've paid a lot of attention to political history. And in certain respect, uh, it may be at the time when I have many graduate students and they have many colleagues who work on environmental history, economic history, uh, social movements, uh, uh, movements of goods and ideas and populations across large uh, regions, across regional uh, histories, uh, tend to look with certain uh, reservation about the place of uh, states. I have, I suppose, belonged to a generation which, for which study of uh, uh, political history was still important. However, Perhaps uh, this is an attempt to try to put uh, that, uh, what do you call it, an old wine in a new bottle. So it's an attempt to try to do that to some extent. I'm not disengaging with all of the above, namely 
economic history, cultural history of Iran and the neighboring lands to some extent. But uh, the framework of a political history seemed to me particularly pertinent in the case of Iran, which is a country that to a large extent, without being exceptional, without uh, uh, succumbing to the exceptionalism in the Iranian case, but it's uh, worth saying that uh, the role of the state is very essential in the way that uh, the whole uh, communal identity, territorial, um, um, territorial foundation of Iran was shaped. Uh, this is not a nationalistic, positivistic history. I'm saying in the case that if you look, uh, perhaps one of the best examples of that being the uh, formation of Safavid Iran. And this is a kind of a paradigm in Iranian history that resonated over five centuries, and that's why probably the concept of modern is important. Uh, Safavid Iran, in a sense, uh, uh, gave us a new space in which uh, we see that the state plays a, a crucial part in the shaping of uh, a uh, religious identity for Iran, and in certain respects, uh, 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 re uh, defines some of the major, uh, uh, I would say, themes in political culture of Iran. It's not only the question of Shiism, the way that it's over the course of this long period of time became part and parcel of Iranian identity, uh, but also in other respects. I've thought about that a little bit, and the endurance of this Safavid paradigm, and came I, with probably five or six categories that I would like to quickly share with you before we move on to more interesting things, uh, looking at some images, and try to see how this evolved over a period of time, particularly my focus is going to be more the turn of the 19th century, that is probably very late 18th century to the early part of the 19th century, the foundation of the Qajar dynasty, the Qajar state. And then in my second lecture tomorrow, I'm going to focus more on the turn of the 20th century. That is from probably uh, the beginning of the constitutional revolution to the rise of the Pahlavi order. Uh, and I would explain why these two complement each other, or in a sense, if not complement each other, it shows two very remarkable uh, shifts that comes about in the shaping of the state, in the shaping of the society, and in the emergence of the idea of modernity. Another feature which I think I would like to emphasize, and I hope there will be time to discuss that a little bit further over the question and answer, that the idea of modernity often has been associated with the phenomenon in the 20th century. That's a kind of acquired modernity that most of us are very familiar. Most historians up to 1950s and 60s talked about modern Iran basically with the rise of Pahlavi dynasty. Uh, a generation later, people were kind of kinder to the history prior to the rise of the Pahlavi and sometimes the beginning of the uh, modern era has been identified as the constitutional revolution at the turn of the century, 1905-1906. Sometimes if you are really very daring, you go back perhaps to the middle of the 19th century or to the early, early 19th century. So this is one of the features that perhaps needs to be problematized and to some extent deconstructed. I would like to talk a little bit about what I would call early modernity, that is early modern modernity, and how that uh, in effect can be applied to the case of the Safavids. One notion that any historian of Iran uh, inevitably would encounter is that the rise of the Safavids reaffirmed the notion that is known to many historians of the Qajar period as the guarded domains of Iran. A concept that, of course, it's history back to the perhaps early 14th century under the Ilkhanids, and then took under the Safavid a more 
uh, concrete uh, form and by the rise of the Qajar period it became an accepted uh, kind of a rubric that defined Iran as a country. The guarded domains of Persia of Mamalik and Mahruse, as some of you I'm sure will realize, uh, is a, in a sense honoring the notion of diversity in uh, the Iranian world. This is the world with many ethnicities, with many languages, with many regional uh, uh, specificity, uh, but yet at the same time, and that's where the role of the states becomes significant, where you would see that the, there is a certain recognition of the fact that all of these are defined under the title of uh, the guarded domains, that it recognizes uh, decentralization at the same time that it recognizes the centrality of the state. There is nothing, by the way, uh, 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 particular about the guarded domain in the guarded domains in the case of Safavid Iran, as I'm sure some colleagues here would know. Both the Ottomans and the Mughal Empire used the same notion, the concept of the uh, uh, of guarded domain and guard, guarded domains, and virtually all of them shared the same kind of a one we might, we might call the Persian political culture that goes back to the early al period. There's a long history, and I know that Dr. Sudava here told me that she's working on an article about the topic. Uh, the guarded domains, uh, in a sense, um, recognizes five, I would say, categories of uh, uh, political culture. The first one, uh, these are contesting and complementing, as I would try to explain. The first of them is that there is a sense of the uh, idea of uh, frontier versus uh, the center. Uh, in uh, Iranian uh, history, the Persian uh, literature, it goes back uh, to the concept that it's often referred to as boom or bar. Uh, for those of you who are familiar uh, with the uh, meaning of that, it goes back to the Shahnameh, perhaps even before the Shahnameh, perhaps it's the late Sasanian phenomenon, in which there is a recognition of the fact that there are frontiers, and the world of the frontiers is different from the world of the center. And there is this kind of a dynamics between the center and the frontier. Frontier is usually mobile. It's uh, uh, tribally structured. It's nomadic. It's pastoral economy, as opposed to the center, which is usually urban. Not always. And there is a close relationship between the two of them, as it has been debated for centuries since Ibn Khaldun and even before that. So that's one concept to keep in mind. It's boom or bar this idea that the nature of the uh, guarded domains is that it recognizes this, uh, 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 this contrast between the center and the periphery. The second uh, uh, also corresponds to that is the concept of Iran versus non-Iran. That is Iran va an Iran. That it's again a very old concept goes to back to Zoroastrian's uh, Sasanian era reiterated so much in the literature uh, as we all know in the Shahnameh. And the idea is not necessarily a kind of a animosity towards the uh, non-Iran, but it's a sense of recognition that the world of the guarded domain basically defines the two uh, beyond the frontiers is the land of non-Iran. And that kind of recognition geographically is important. It's conceptually is important. And uh, uh, Iran, of course, had very long experience of facing uh, non-Iran. Um, at least uh, ever since the rise of the Safavids, Iran faced a kind of an east-west, two-frontier world in which the Ottomans and its west, and the, most of the time the Uzbeks, on its eastern frontiers has gave has given a very a conscious idea of how Iran versus an Iran uh, functions. Uh, uh, and of course, in the course of the 19th century, as I'm going to show in some of the slides, there is a very significant shift 
that this two-sided front here, east, east, east west turns into a north-south with the emergence of Christian empires on the Iranian frontiers, Russia in the north and British India in the south and in the Persian Gulf. And therefore, this shift also plays some part in the greater awareness of the sense of Iran versus non-Iran. As you know, the etymological meaning of the term an-Iran, meaning non-Iran, basically. Nothing more than that. Uh, the third uh, of, this, uh, of these categories or concepts that are important for us to keep in mind, and indeed was a kind of a guideline for me to try to go through a long period of history um, in my book, is the concept of the court versus the administration. It's more to do with the domestic structure of the state. That is what in Persian is referred to as dargah and divan. Dargah is a reference to the court, the royal court, and the divan is a reference to the administration of the state, that it was under the control of the chief ministers and the ministerial office. And the relationship and the story between the uh, dargah and the divan was always a very problematic one, was always a lot of tension in this relationship between the two of them as we are very familiar in numerous examples in modern history and in pre-modern history. The whole idea of Waziri side, the, uh, the, uh, the execution of the Wazirs is part of this tension. You would find it throughout the history and particularly in modern times. It's a very sad phenomenon, but the tension between the two of them is very remarkable in better understanding of how the history of the guarded domains has been shaped. And finally, they uh, are not uh, finally, but number four of these, uh, of these binaries or uh, this uh, kind of a, a distinction that you would find within the society is the one between the state and the, as it's often been referred to, good religion, din va dolat. And this is a concept, again, which particularly reaffirmed in the Safavid period with the establishment of the uh, Shi Empire, uh, with, with the recognition of Shiism as the creed, uh, the official creed of the state, and the enforcement of it by the Safavid rulers. It's one of the very significant character that, uh, that uh, differentiates Iran from the other so-called gunpowder empires. Uh, neither the Ottomans, uh, it can be said, I think with some assurance that although they consider themselves as the trustees of the shrines, the holy shrines of, uh, of Islam, the holy cities of Islam, and uh, uh, claim to be the caliphs of Islamic world for most of their history, uh, nevertheless, they never actually enforced an official creed over their population, for better or for worse, certainly for better, as far as the human rights are concerned. Uh, um, neither the Mughal Empire did so in that regard. Perhaps the closest example that I can uh, think of is the Spanish Empire uh, in the in Western Mediterranean, uh, the Habsburgs, uh, who actually indeed very actively enforced Catholicism as the uh, religion of the land. Uh, so that plays a very important part, this relationship between the religious establishment and uh, the, the state. Anybody who looks even in the early uh, examples of the books, uh, the Mirrors for Princess, Siyasat Nome is an excellent example of that. You would see that this concept has been time and again emphasized in the, in the literature. And uh, perhaps later on we would have time to look at that as well. Finally, uh, it's the concept of the dolat va rayat, that is the state and the subjects. Uh, often we tend to consider the uh, a Iranian state as uh, many of the Orientalists in the uh, 19th century would have reminded us, going back all the way to Montesquieu in the 18th century, that Iran is a despotic empire and its concept of despotism has been greatly emphasized. But as a matter of fact, again, if you look at many of the 
mirrors uh, the books of the councils to the kings, you would see that there is a very functional relationship between the state and the, and the subjects. And the very recognition of the fact of that there is a so-called circle of equity in which the state would not survive without the prosperity of the subjects, whether in reality that has been uh, indeed uh, 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 practiced or not, is a matter for the historians to look in any particular epoch. But the concept, the awareness of the fact that this is not a, a absolute state with com complete control over its uh, uh, subjects, but rather is obligated by a certain uh, practices and a certain recognition of the fact that the survival of the state very deeply depends on the prosperity of, the, of its subjects. All right, looking at all of these five categories, I want to show you some slides about first the uh, early slides, I say <laughs> images, because we are in the age of PowerPoints here. So, um, uh, and try to elaborate on some of the things visually, I think would help us to uh, get a better, better grasp of that. Could I borrow your pointer? Thank you. Okay. I suppose that's how it moves. These are the categories that I've talked with some uh, variations. I'm not going to dwell on this one. A map of Iran to try to show you, of course, need not to. Is this how it works? Yeah, top one. Top one, top one. Yeah. Okay. All right. The peripheries, particularly in the course of the 18th century, um, in, which is a period in Iranian history often associated with the age of decentralization or perhaps political chaos, although in terms of intellectual uh, developments, a very actually fruitful era. But the periphery between the north and the south became very evident. Northern parts of the country, perhaps all the way to what is today Tehran, and Tehran is not without a reason to be in the capital. Uh, became the capital. But this all area is kind of mostly nomadic, Turkic uh, speaking population. Uh, whereas the southern part of Iran mostly is mostly in variety of dialects of Persian. And the distinction between the two of them after the collapse of the Safavids in 1722 became very evident. And the whole century, almost 75 years, of what is usually referred to as interregnum, passed between these two, the two, between the fall of the Safavid empires, with some intervals in between, and the rise of the Qajars uh, in the early, 20th, uh, early 19th century. And the division between the two became very evident in terms of much of the clashes that happened. After all, the Afsharids, Nadir Shah, was the representative of this northern uh, Turkic nomadic alliances that stretched all the way to what is today um, uh, Western Afghanistan. And the emergence of the Zands were the example of the southern state that um, uh, was somewhat conscious of its Persian identity. And its very foundations were, um, were uh, actually depended on the loyalty very questionable loyalty of the southern uh, uh, nomadic uh, and urban population. OK, so if you move on from this one, the first image I want to show you, as you might guess, uh, this is Agha Muhammad Khan. That's just about the time when he eventually, in 1786, uh, for the first time acknowledged the title of the Shah. Um, and the person who stands next to him is uh, Ibrahim Khan Etemad uh, Dole, later on Etemad Dole, Ibrahim Khan Shirazi, better known as Kalantar Shirazi. And the conventional history of Iran has not been very kind to either of them. Uh, Agha Muhammad Khan has often been recognized as uh, this uh, sadistic, um, 
uh, a conqueror that uh, destroys the cities, and he did a lot of that. Uh, and uh, Ibrahim Khan was recognized as, or often accused of being the chief traitor to the Zans, who actually opened the gates of the city of Shiraz, the capital of the Zans in the south, to Agha Muhammad Khan, and brought to an end, eventually, the effective rule of the Zans in the south. Well, the image is interesting because, as you can see, he's not wearing a crown yet. Uh, actually, there is another image of the same posture with Agha Muhammad Khan wearing a crown. But here in this one, he does not. And it's as if uh, Ibrahim Khan Shirazi, which Iranians have to be very uh, grateful to him, uh, was uh, the figure that, as a matter of fact, persuaded him and give him the vision that the break between the north and the south should come to an end and a more unified state should emerge in Iran. And that's precisely the project of a state building that took place under Agha Khan. Uh, what was it? All right. How much time do I have? OK, good. Uh, let's see how far we can go with this one. There was another thing I wanted to say about him. Oh, yeah. There is, just to change this from this kind of very generalities to go something a little bit more uh, tangible. Uh, I have uh, done a comparison between this gentleman, uh, with um, uh, Haji Ibrahim Kalantar Shirazi, and uh, his... Uh, his colleague and cohort, uh, uh, another Kalantar, the title of Kalantar for some of you who know him is the mayor. He was the mayor of the capital, Shiraz. Prior to him, there was another mayor with the same title of Kalantar, Mirza Muhammad Kalantar Shirazi. We are very much indebted to him as well because he left behind the last year of his year, one of the earliest autobiographies in modern time that we have. Some of you may have read it. It's a fascinating account about his lifetime when he is in the captivity of Agha Muhammad Khan in Tehran. Complains throughout his autobiography. Most fascinating account of his entire life. He was born in 1720 and he died in 1786. So he virtually, most of his childhood, youth, mature life, he witnessed what happened to Iran in the 18th century. So I would like to read a passage at the very end of his biography, when, which actually he, autobiography, which he actually dedicated to his wife and names her and gives a great honor uh, and respect uh, to her. Okay, he says, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, rather I would say, um, uh, irreverent language that he uses throughout the book, so I'm not responsible, but he says, may dust be on the grave of the people of Iran. So it shows the depth of his disappointment. May dust be on the grave of Iranians for this scarcity of capable men. I wish a woman had come to power that would have been competent like the one in Russia, his reference to Catherine the Great. <coughs> Central Iran has been destroyed half by this bastard, he's referring to Agha Muhammad Khan, <laughs> and the other half by that rascal, which means Jafar Khan, the penultimate Zand ruler of the South. So it's very clear recognition that he basically disowns both these powers as being tribal, uh, nomadic powers that destroy the cities. He is concerned with the life of the city. Uh, two faithless, two tyrants, two damned souls. And then he continues. Oh God, he actually supplicates in this uh, uh, by saying, Oh God, 
the pure and the omnipotent. Have you created the people of Iran for these two unmanly cowards? You are not impotent. You are omnipotent. Now for the sake of your saints and in honor of your, uh, of your favored, send us a king who at least is in appearance looks like a human being. <laughs> is a reference again to Aga Muhammad Khan, as some of you might know, he was castrated and he appeared not very manly. Okay. Um, uh, what is wrong with Europeans? What is wrong with Zoroastrians and the infidels? Now two demon-faced evildoers who are servants of their evil nature have come to dominate us. Do not allow it to happen, and do not leave your country leaderless. And then he ends by saying something very remarkable. Throughout his autobiography, being a Shirazi, thousands of verses that he constantly cites in his, uh, in his memoirs, he again goes back to poetry. He says, Hinting of the awareness uh, of certain historical causality, he, he quotes a, a verse from Rumi. Uh, first I read it in Persian and then translation in English. In jahan ku hasto fe'l ma neda. Baz gardad in neda hara sada. The world is a mountain and our deeds voices. The voice has echoes. To us, they will return. So it's just a very modern sense of recognition that it's the action of human beings and nations that brings about the uh, misfortunes upon them, including himself. And then he follows by another verse, this time by Hafiz, very famous one. Har che hast az qamat nasaz bi andam mast, var na tashrif to. It is our frail and crooked body that we should blame. Otherwise, your robe of honor is not short on anybody's frame. So in a sense, again, a recognition of the fact that it's our own doings that brings about uh, a, uh, what happens to us. And I see in this a sense of modernity. What happens to Mirza Muhammad Kalantar? He was sent back in the last year of his life from Tehran to Isfahan. In, he was in captivity of Aga Muhammad Khan, and he dies in Isfahan after. His colleague, the gentleman that we see here, who actually is uh, cited with great honors in the memoirs of Mirza Muhammad, uh, he has a different attitude. And here it's what we see the role of the ministerial power to build the nation, to build a state, and how the building of the state, as you can see in this kind of metaphoric image, is uh, apparent here. In 1800, after Aga Muhammad Khan was assassinated in a campaign in the Caucasus, his, uh, uh, his uh, nephew, Fatali Ali Khan, uh, Fat Ali Shah, comes to power. And indeed, Fath Ali Shah, in many respects, is that kind of a beautiful king, the handsome king that uh, Muhammad Shah, that uh, Muhammad Khan Kalantar was after. He has a conversation that cites by John Malcolm in his first trip in 1800, uh, in which Malcolm advises uh, him, Haji Ibrahim, uh, that he should be a little bit more tolerant toward young Fat Ali Shah and, uh, and bear with some of his uh, misbehaviors. In response, then the Grand Vizier uh, rested, uh, uh, restated his yearning uh, for a united country under a strong government. And that's a side, direct quote. I could easily save myself, but Persia again be plunged in warfare. 
My objective has been to give my country one king. I cared not whether he was a Zand or a Rajar, so that there was an end to internal destruction. I have seen enough of these scenes of blood. I will be concerned in no more than that. Uh, so in a sense, here again, a concept of, uh, I would consider it as a notion of modernity, that a minister, that an administrator, is prepared to accept any kind of a nomadic ruler, provided that the foundation of a state is going to be consolidated. And that's what was his project, that he basically lost his life. He was assassinated. He was uh, executed by Fatah as part of these trends of the tension between the court and the divan. So quickly move on to the next one. Uh, it wasn't without a reason that uh, Agha Muhammad Khan became the master of Iran. This is a map, one of the maps in my book, that shows the rise and the consolidation of the Qajar dynasty between 1779 and 1800. And I don't want to go through all of this, but it's just to show you the number of campaigns that were fought over a short period of time in order to make that <clears throat> kind of consolidation and unification of Iran a possibility. And of course, again, not without a reason that in the famous sack of Kerman in 1794, uh, he uh, 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 commit some of the most atrish, uh, 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 some of the most uh, 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 atricious uh, uh, crimes of killing and um, and uh, and blinding the uh, local population, but he does it for a reason. The end of this uh, campaign in Kerman basically is the end of the resistance of the south to the Rajars and unification of Iran. By 1794, a year later, for the second time, he coronates as a king. This is a painting from <clears throat> the book known as Shahanshah Name by Fat Ali Khan uh, Sabo Kashani, uh, the uh, court poet of, uh, of uh, Fat Ali Shah, uh, that narrates all the history of the early Rajar period, and here <coughs> portrays Agha Muhammad Khan, this time with his crown. And his army committing uh, acts of uh, incredible violence towards the local population. He chooses the capital. He basically abandons both Shiraz and Isfahan, the capital of the Safavids and the capitals of the Zans. He goes to a small, uh, almost second or third rate town in the frontier between North and the South. If I go back here to them, perhaps in this one is better shown. Sure. Uh, as I said, Tehran was located here between the northern and the southern region. He avoids going to Isfahan and to Shiraz because he's afraid of the inner politics of both cities, the roles of the notables that has destroyed many examples before him and he doesn't want to get involved. He also, actually Tehran was chosen in 18, uh, 1786 because it was in the trade, two well-known trade route of east-west between Azerbaijan and Khorasan and between the Caspian and the Persian Gulf or the south. So there is an economic reason for the choice of um, Tehran. And as you can see from this image, it's virtually nothing. This is, an 18, this is an 1818 by Cape Porter. Uh, what you see here probably is a city of 20 to 30,000, no more than that. And of course, the whole country at the end of the 18th century was subjected to a huge amount of depopulation. So other cities were not in a better shape. But this is particularly insignificant place. There is no class of the high-ranking mujtahids, uh, the ulama in Tehran. There are no class of notables, big landowners. Uh, so in effect, the ruler had a sort of a free hand 
in order to develop his own cosmo, uh, 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 his own uh, capital. Uh, this is um, one of the earliest structures uh, built first under Armand Matron and then completed uh, under uh, Fatali Shah in Shiraz. It's known as Takht uh, Qajar or Takht Qajar. Uh, it is today known as Bagh Takht, although not much of this has structure as far as I know has survived. But the significance of it is, and this is again one of the early themes of the 19th century, is in my opinion a certain inspiration from Persepolis. Being uh, in the south, both Agha Muhammad Khan and uh, Fat Ali Shah, both of them were spent many years of captivity in the Zand capital and very well versed, particularly Fat Ali Shah in the ancient understanding of Iran's ancient culture. So it's not surprising to see that something. And there is another one like this built in Tehran shortly after. The same phenomenon you can see there's a Safavid project of building uh, squares. And uh, this one in front of the Masjid Shah in Tehran. And uh, I think I'm not making an exaggeration to say that the same kind of an angle entrance into the, um, into the courtyard of the Masjid Shah is uh, very, uh, very um, reminds us of the, uh, of the Maidan Naqsh Jahan in Isfahan and the same kind of pattern. Uh, of course, we have a great expert here. I should be careful about what I'm saying, but that's just a suggestion. All right. Uh, 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 this is the same mosque that today, like any other Shah mosque in Iran, has named Imam Khomeini Mosque. <laughs> against, incidentally, all the very strict restrictions of the, sh of the Shi'i uh, law of uh, endowment that does not allow the change of name of the, of, uh, the endowers, the person who has endowed the uh, uh, charitable building. I'm sorry. The same uh, kind of an idea of a courtyard uh, in front of the Arg uh, of uh, Tehran. And we see some of the early attempts to try to drill uh, the soldiers of the new army, Nizam e Jadid, is one of the early examples of adopting from Western model of uh, army, or building uh, uh, caravanserais. This one in Kashan, uh, built by Haji Sayyid Hussein Sadr Esfahani, the famous uh, uh, chief minister of Fatali Shah, as part of a huge project of construction of the early Qajar period that usually has been uh, uh, ignored. The uh, he was a great builder, probably as great builder as, as Abbas the first was. So in many respects, you see still many of the mosques and the uh, popular buildings, public buildings that were built under Fath Ali Shah. And the idea of actually uh, uh, presenting himself as part of a long uh, tradition of kingship in Iran, uh, in which Fat Ali Shah with his incredible beard here in the center and with his, with his sons um, on both sides, the senior sons, and the minister on the very right, uh, <coughs> again inspired, this is in Cheshma Ali near Tehran, close to the ruins of the Ray, which by the way, by early 19th century was still much more visible than what it is today, which is virtually nothing has survived of it. Um, it wasn't without a reason that he has done, that he has built it next to an ancient uh, ruins. Uh, and the idea of hunting, uh, again, an ancient uh, 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 preoccupation of the rulers, the idea of the feast and the fight, Razm uh, Babazm, is being recognized here in the, by the uh, age of Fat Ali Shah, is kind of modeling his entire uh, uh, state on the uh, the idea of legitimacy of state and the concept of uh, in, in ancient memories of, of the past. 
Of course, that was not the only undertaking. As part of this royal project of legitimacy is production of uh, uh, books of uh, uh, historiography. This one by uh, <clears throat> Abdul Razak Donboli Maftun is a very well-known text of the early Qajar period, Maasir Sultaniyeh, Majestic Glorious Deeds. Uh, one of the earliest books published in uh, Persian, um, in actually typographic, um, in um, <clears throat> Tabriz, uh, as you can see with the date 1826. Uh, it's typical, the significance of the uh, Maasir Sultania of this historiography is to try to coach the Qajar emergence as part of the global project of empires. So there is a talk about this, uh, the, the British, the, the Russian Empire, the British Empire, the French under Napoleon. So you see all this kind of phenomenon of uh, the state within a broader context emerges in the early 19th century and of course the Ottomans. Uh, again, as part of the state's uh, patronage of the religious establishment and this close relationship between the religion and the state, you can see as one of the, the first book that was published in Persian uh, in Iran, again in typography, is uh, uh, Jihadiyah, there's a book of Jihad, which was a collection of the fatwas that was that was commissioned and put together by Mirza Issa uh, Qa'im Maram and his son Mirza Abul Qasim, both of them under Abbas Mirza's ministers of Abbas Mirza in Tabriz. And the purpose of it was to actually mobilize the general public against Russian invasion in the Caucasus and the Iranian provinces in the north, uh, which he defines as Russian sedition in the guarded domain. Uh, Fetne Rus, as Iranians love to rhyme it, Fetne Rus dar Mulk Mahrus. This is a reference, it was almost a war motto during the course of the Second World War, the Second uh, Russo Persian War. And also, as part of this patronage and uh, attention to the so called good religion, is the early publications against among the numerous Shi'i texts that was published in the, 19, uh, in the 1820s is the publication of a treatise on question and answer, kind of catechism, uh, it's a collection of the fatwas, uh, published of all the people by a, a, a Georgian um, uh, uh, courtier, uh, that for the first time actually brought printing to Iran in the 1820s. That's Manu Shekhan, Motamed Dole Gorji, and after him was known as Chop Motamedi, the Motamedi uh, printing, that you see in numerous of these examples. This is the work of this gentleman, Sayyid Muhammad Baghir Shafti, the Hojatul Islam, probably the greatest Shi'i authority of the early 19th century in Isfahan. The significance of him being so greatly promoted was indeed to bring the idea of the religious establishment closer to the center, not in the Atabat, not in Iraq, but in Iran, in Isfahan. So the close relationship, I have an article about him in response to a British, uh, 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 John McNeil, the British envoy in uh, during the course of the 19, 1830s uh, War of Herat, that the British representatives pleads to him to interfere. And he very clearly and openly says that there is a division of labor. We are in charge of the judiciary. We are not in the charge of the state. The affairs of the state are for the kings. This is a very remarkable. Actually, he uses the word velayat. He says velayat qaza and velayat hukm. He uses a very clear concept that these are two different functions on two different institutions of the state and uh, religion. Uh, curiously enough, just as an anecdote, this was reprinted, the, the article is in Persian, it was reprinted in Qom, in uh, a journal, and created 
some actually debate, because this goes precisely against the idea of velayate fari by, by this uh, 19th century figure. Uh, a a, a, himself a bibliophile, had a great uh, uh, library in uh, Esfahan, and read about a wide range of topics. He was not precisely speaking uh, intellectual, but he committed a lot of um, acts of uh, sedition, but nevertheless is a kind of intriguing figure. Building uh, for the sake of uh, glorifying religion, the one on the left is the Madrasa Sultaniyah, one of many built by Fatah Ali Shah, this one in Kashan, for the Naragi family. Again, an attempt to try to uh, augment the position of the Mujtahids in Iran vis-a-vis -vis those uh, of, of those in the Atabat. <coughs> and the one on the right is the uh, mosque of Agha Buzurg, also built for the Naraqi family, not by the ruler, although they, uh, uh, they supervised the, the, on the period of Muhammad Shah and ended in the early. Thank you so much. All right, publications of the lithographs on popular literature, uh, Shi'i literature, particularly of the cult of Hussein and the stories of Karbala, very common during the 19th century. Some of it done by uh, the rulers and by the state, some of it done by the actually bazaar. So it's also a very interesting phenomenon, the rise of bazaar as publishers for religious literature in this period, or uh, in this case, the portal entrance to the Teke, Moshirul Mulk in Shiraz, that also gives us the story of Karbala. It's one of the most remarkable. Unfortunately, it's been lost or destroyed under the Islamic Republic. Or the cult of Ali, that is closer to the royal cult. And it's also very numerous examples of that were produced in the mid Rajah period. Uh, in relation to the outside world, uh, we see that of the uh, uh, Fatah Ali Shah and uh, uh, receiving uh, the uh, uh, Captain Malcolm's mission in 1800 uh, by the East India Company, the first attempt by both sides, a very complex story, what happened really, uh, in which still Fatah Ali Shah considered himself as the great ruler of the region to which the British and this other company is paying homage. It was the gifts was received as a tribute coming from India to him. Uh, and in the very famous painting of the panels in the Gulistan, in the uh, Nagaristan palace, now destroyed, but we have several copies of it in which the whole story of the guarded domain was told. The two panels at the bottom and the top are the, for the both sides of the hall. The center one, which shows Fatah Ali Shah and his senior sons in the center. All of it, in effect, we can talk a whole lecture about the significance of this painting, uh, in which all the elements of centrality of the state has been portrayed, including all the notables uh, of the court that were shown and uh, representatives of foreign powers. The three on the right uh, is John Malcolm, uh, 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 Hartford Jones, and uh, Sir Gore Osley. Uh, and the three on the left are the French uh, competitors and contesters to the British Empire that were shown, the Gardin Michel and Joubert and the others who came early in the uh, Qajar period. It's, it's, of course, it's kind of anachronistic. But the purpose of the painting is actually to try to show the centrality of the state in trying to bring together all of the numerous representatives from various uh, regional courts were brought into the, uh, into the painting, including the Wahhabis, by the way. There is a, and including one from the Tipu Sultan, which by, it, by itself is a fascinating story. So I quickly move on. The only the only group that are missing in the picture, of course, are the Russians. And not without a reason, because they were met in the battlefield. <laughs> and that's the scene of the Fatah Ali Shah fighting a Russian commander, the Tsitsianov, in 1805. 
and that's one of the very few victories of the Iranians in the war against the Russians that eventually ended in um, 19, 1813 in the Treaty of Gulistan. Um, and the loss of the territory in the uh, uh, whole of the 19th century with greater emphasis in the loss here of the province in the Caucasus. I just wanted to show you that how much this actually affected the, uh, the uh, credibility of the Qajars as a state. Loss of the territory basically disrupted this whole concept of creation of a legitimate state on the model of the Safavids. And this very remarkable painting by Boshkov, a Russian painter, this is the last one I'm showing you. In 1828, in the Treaty of Turkmenchai, when Iranians are actually weighing gold from the scale that has been hanging from the roof, weighing gold with representatives of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the vanquished Iranians and the conquered uh, Russians, uh, that basically bankrupt the Qajar state, the amount of the, uh, amount of the war indemnity that were paid to the, uh, to the Russians with extraordinary impact on the overall legitimacy of the Qajar state uh, by the end of the uh, war. Um, we would follow the story here, uh, uh, from here on, in the latter part of the uh, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century later on. Uh, I hope there are some ideas or some questions that I have raised, and I would be happy to get some uh, questions afterwards.